Spica is the brightest object in the constellation of Virgo and one of the 20 brightest stars in the night sky. The designated Alpha Virginis is located around 250 light years from Earth. Spica is in fact, like many hot blue stars of its kind, a spectroscopic binary star. Indeed, the two stars are so close together that they are egg-shaped rather than spherical and can only be separated by their spectra. Hi everyone, Vega here, and after a brief break for holidays, we return to our Brightest Star series with the last entry in the top 20, Spica. So, let's get to it. In our Brightest Star series, Spica is the final piece in the puzzle. We've now documented the 20 brightest stars in the sky, amongst other interesting places and destinations along the way. This video will primarily focus on Spica alone, but alongside Arcturus and Regulus, Spica forms part of a beautiful asterism known as the Spring Triangle. Don't forget to check out videos on Regulus, the Harry Potter star, and Arcturus too, although I think we should probably revisit the Red Giant star as it's been a while since we last discussed it. Interestingly, as we see here, the lower line of the Spring Triangle between Spica and Regulus nearly represents the ecliptic, the path of the Sun and the planets. And this of course means that the star system can be occulted by the moon, and sometimes even by planets. The last planetary occultation of Spica occurred when Venus passed in front of the star on November the 10th, 1783, and the next occultation will occur on the 2nd of September in 2197, when Venus again passes in front of Spica. Brightest star in Virgo, Spica was of course important to the Egyptians, and indeed they built altars to worship the star and called it the Star of Prosperity. Spica is in fact, after the Southern Hemisphere's Acrox, the second nearest massive binary star system to the Sun, and so it has been the subject of many observational studies. It's quite common for hot blue stars to be found in pairs, and alongside Spica, Hadar Acrox Mimosa, Algol Mintaka, Shubus and Orion's Alnitak are other examples of this. We locate Spica by following the arc of the handle of the Big Dipper, or plough, to Arcturus, and then continue on to the same Anglia distance to Spica. Some of you may have heard the phrase, Arc to Arcturus and Spike to Spica, which does make it sound kind of cool, doesn't it? Spica's binary stars orbit each other every four days, which means they are very, very close together. In fact, they're so close together that it cannot be resolved as two stars, even through a telescope, and the stars are mutually distorted through their gravitational interaction. In other words, they are made egg-shaped by each star mutually pulling on the other. This effect increasingly causes the apparent magnitude of the star system to vary over an interval that matches the orbital period. That's where the matching ends though, and both stars are thought to rotate faster than their mutual orbital period. And this lack of synchronization alongside the highly elliptical orbit that they both follow probably indicates that Spica is a young star system. It's thought that over the time, the mutual tidal interaction of the pair may lead to a more stable circular orbit and indeed rotational synchronization. But this does lead to another fascinating question, doesn't it? Normally when planets are so close into the host stars, they can become tidally locked. But does that also apply to close-in binary stars, much like the Spica system? Can stars actually become tidally locked to each other? While the Spica system is young, the two stars could potentially become tidally locked together eventually. There's not all that much information readily available on this subject, and if anyone knows anything better than I do, please let me know in the comments section below. It is expected though that close binary stars throughout the universe can become tidally locked to each other given sufficient time. The effects on the stars at this point of the ceasing of rotation are unclear though, and if I do find out any more information, I'll be sure to post a video on it as soon as that occurs. It's certainly a fascinating conundrum though, and one that does appear to me to be overlooked at this point. Back of course though to Spica, and the primary star, which strangely doesn't have the designation of Spica A, has a stellar classification of B1, 3 to 4, and this means it's a very, very hot blue star, and it's now left the main sequence. Indeed, its luminosity class matches the spectrum of a star that is midway between a subgiant and giant star, and its evolutionary stage has been calculated to be near, or slightly past the end of the main sequence phase. The primary Spica star has a mass of more than 10 times the mass of the Sun and 7 times its radius. We see it here compared to the Sun, Arcturus and Regulus. Spica's primary star is about 20,000 times brighter than the Sun, and indeed as it outshines its companion, Spica's secondary star, by nearly 9 times. 
primary star is one of the nearest stars to the Sun that has enough mass to actually end its life in a Type II supernova. As we've already mentioned, Spica has only recently left the main sequence, so this event is not likely to occur for several more million years, and indeed Spica is at a safe distance. The secondary star, and again also without the designation of Spica B, is thought to suffer from being hit by a strong stellar wind coming from the primary. With about 7 times the mass of the Sun and 3.6 times the star's radius, it remains a very, very powerful star, and to these its stellar classification is B25, which makes it a slightly less hot than the primary, but a hot blue main sequence star nonetheless. We might indeed then feel a little sorry for this star, as if it were on its own, it would remain one of the brightest 20 stars in the sky, and perhaps have a more fancy name than Spica's secondary star. Be that as it may, the Spica system's radio velocity of 1 km a second means that the stars are more or less speeding through the galaxy at exactly the same speed as our solar system. And what this means is that Spica will remain similar in our skies for a much longer period than many other stars that are approaching or indeed dissipating from our Sun. In this next graphic, let's now imagine the view we might see if the Spring Triangle asterism were to suddenly somehow approach our solar system and arrive at the distance of one light year. First of all, we see the beautiful red giant of Arcturus appear, shining at roughly minus 8.4 apparent magnitude. Alpha Boetes, Arcturus will be bright enough to shine throughout the day and night on our Earth. Next, the Harry Potter star of Regulus appears. Alpha Leonis shines now at minus 9, or roughly twice the brightness of Arcturus. The hot blue subgiant star now takes its place as the brightest star in the sky after the Sun. Now finally we see the Spica stars appear. First of all the secondary star, and this arrives and it's now at minus 11.21 parent magnitudes, and almost indeed as bright as the full moon. And I think now you hopefully begin to get the impression of just how powerful this star is. However, as again is always the case in Spica's system, the primary star appears to steal the thunder, and now it appears shining at minus 13.6 on the huge vast distance of one light year, and it massively outshines the moon now. Finally, we merge the two Spica stars together, as even at one light year distance they would be far too close together to easily distinguish from one another. The combined magnitude ends at a minus 13.72, as Spica's primary star engulfs the secondary once and for all. Spica is a close together binary star system some 280 light years from Earth. It travels the galaxy at the same pace as our Sun, and will remain almost equally bright in our skies for many, many years. Part of the beautiful asterism of the Spring Triangle, it would vastly outshine its colleagues of Regulus and Arcturus if it were at the same distance. The final star in our top 20 brightest star series, Spica is in its infancy and it will be watching us from afar, probably for its entire existence. Thanks for watching and consider subscribing if you haven't already. If you would like to support the channel further you could consider buying me a coffee and I'll link this in the description. Thanks to those of you that have already done so. And if you have any videos or subjects that you'd like to see brought to life, don't forget to let me know in the comments below and it could just be your idea that shows up next week. Take good care of yourselves and look after your friends and family well, and I'll see you on the next one.